Hello friends, I have been studying and working through one of the most complex conversations that Christ has with an individual in the Gospels. And it is the one where he is interacting with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And there is this crazy banter that goes back and forth. And all of it is based on Torah. They are using the, the, the text of the Torah, the stories in Torah to, to go back and forth. And Christ is trying to get her to a point of confrontation. And the story is laid out where it's talking about Jacob's well. It's about finding a husband. It's about this water from the rock that the children of Israel had in the desert. It's a stone being rolled away. It's a fountain flowing freely out. And, and Christ is using all of this to bring her to a moment of confrontation. And I want to see if, if you can connect the dots that are woven through this story and, and come to the same conclusion that the Samaritan woman did. Because she declares to the town, I have found a man. Take a listen to this teaching and see if you come to the same conclusion. Plot of ground, Jacob's fountain, Christ sat down beside the fountain. <clears throat> now, what do we have to ask? Why is John being so precise about the location? Why isn't it, hey, outside of town there's a well, that's where Christ met her. No, 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 no. Something is being set up here that is extremely important. Why is it saying that it is a fountain and why is it Jacob's fountain? 1 Corinthians 4 brings up a concept that is laced through the text. Listen to this. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud of the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Listen. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's one of the craziest questions to ask. How in the world did this rock follow the children of Israel in the desert? The text says, there go the children of Israel, and right behind them is hopping along a rock. <laughs> I don't know if it hopped, I don't know if it walked, not sure. But there's a rock that follows them, and that rock is in picture Christ, and out of this rock flows living water directly from God. I know, you're looking at me going, what in the world is this text saying? Remember, pictures. It's trying to show us something that's happening here. This idea of a rock that followed him is, is all throughout the Old Testament text. We even see it in the Midrash. We even see it in the historical documents. Philo, first century historian, talks about it um, by saying that uh, 40 years did he rain bread from heaven for them and brought them quails from the sea and a well of water following them. I know. Midrash, think of Midrash as a Jewish story about their heritage. That's really what it is. They didn't have text at that point, so they're just telling stories. It's, it's Uncle Joe did this, Grandpa Steve did that, and it's just passed down generation to generation. And a lot of this is, is talking about it. Akiba talks about it, that says that everywhere their forefathers went, they, they dug a well and water just sprung forth. Abraham digs a well, springs forth. Jacob digs a well, water comes out. Isaac redigs the well, water just comes gushing out. Over and over and over again, the forefathers dig wells and water just comes out of everywhere. It's in the backside of the desert, it's on the coastal plain, it's in Shechem, it's in the north. Everywhere they dig, water just gushes out. In the Midrash, they say that that is the same source. Makes sense. Everywhere they dig, water comes out. In the Exodus story, we have this this song that's recorded that Miriam sings. It's right after they get the well, strikes the rock, water comes gushing forth. Listen to her song. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well. Sing about it, about the well that the princes dug, their forefathers, the no that the nobles of the people sang, the nobles with scepters and staffs. Then they went from the wilderness to Matana, which means gift, from Matana to Nahalia, from Nahalia to Barnath, from Barnath to the valley of Moab. And everywhere they went, this well was with them. Bear with me. This is tied, this well that Abraham dug, the children of Israel, out of water out of the rock, is tied to Jacob's well. Anytime you read Jacob's well, you need to imagine water gushing forth, fountain springing out with living water from God, because God promised it. So, where is Jesus sitting? Beside 
The well, which springs forth living water directly from God, springs forth. He doesn't need a bucket. All right. So, why does Christ then say, will you give me a drink? Why doesn't he say, can I borrow your bucket? Better question. I'm a guy. She's just walked from a half mile from town carrying these things. Can I borrow your bucket? Or can I help you? Why does he say, will you give me a drink? Why those words? Where in the story does that happen already? Abraham sends his servant north to find a wife for his son. He sits beside the well and says, if there's a girl that comes and gives me a drink, that's the one. What does he ask her? Single woman walking in. Will you give me a drink? Wells are where you go to find a husband. So we see the text. We see it with Isaac and Rebekah. We see it with Jacob and Rachel. We see it with Moses and Zipporah. Anytime you see a single woman walking to a well, she is going to find a husband. Now, it it plays a very interesting aspect of our story about husbands. There is also then, the woman responds very specifically then, By saying, are you greater than our father Jacob? How does she know this story? She is already seeing the Jewish man, knowing where he's at, what this source is, hears him quote a line out of a movie, okay, almost, and immediately jumps and says, wait a minute here, are your father than our... I'm going to tie this to Jacob. He just quoted the story. We don't, we often underestimate these characters in the story. This is why, going back to her being maybe a different powerful figure, she knows the text almost better than anybody that interacts with Christ that I've that you come across because she immediately puts this together and go, wait a minute here. Are you saying? That you are greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock, immediately tying the story together. There's one more that I need to tie in here. When Jacob continues his journey, goes north and, and meets with the people in the plains, he comes to a well, but there's a, a stone over the mouth of the well. This happens a lot because you need to keep animals out of the well. It's also very sandy, wind's blowing. You just don't want stuff falling in your well, so you cover it with a big rock. Some of them are round, some of them more like a plug, big old heavy things. You can actually see there's big old logs here to help leverage this thing out of the way. But he gets to the well, and it says, when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. This is out of Genesis 29. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Now Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? Haran, they replied. He said, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him. Then Jacob asked, is he well? Yes, he is. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. I love this part. Look, he said, the sun is still high. Whoa. Whoa. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. He's like, okay, guys, woman coming. It's about noon. One of these guys just, just, just disappear for a little bit. <laughs> I see a woman. I want to be alone here with her. We can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then then Jacob kissed Rachel, and she began to weep aloud. I would love to have been there. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father. All right, within a few moments, this Samaritan woman picks up on the story and goes, wait a minute here, are you better than Jacob? One, it's a little selfish of her question, are you going to... Fill my jugs up with water here? But where's your bucket? If you are, my job just got a lot easier because I don't have to put down my bucket 
100, I think it's 28 feet down Jacob's well. It's a very, very deep well. It's going to overflow. So John does this very quickly, ties everything together. It's a fountain, source of living water. Jesus there, single woman, coming to a well, going to find a husband. The gift of living water, overflowing fountain. But did you catch where Jesus is sitting? Near the well. Now the text doesn't say this, but is he sitting on the rolled away stone? That's called foreshadowing. Now, it's one thing for us to put this story together so quickly because we have it in our Bibles, but she is doing this in a conversation. The Samaritan Bible is the Torah only. That's all they had. Obviously, because of separation, they didn't have the prophets, they didn't have the writings, just the Torah. Today, the best preserved Torah is the Samaritan Bible. We still use it as a source. She immediately puts this together. But she realizes Christ doesn't have a bucket. But she knows the story and wondering if he's going to do a miracle. Now, Christ responds and says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I'll give them will never thirst. And she's replying, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. And he replies, Go and tell. Go and call your husband and come back. Christ's encounters always take a turn when you don't expect it. A twist of a saying. A pointed comment. She was right in line with him bantering back and forth. Oh, we're talking about this story? Okay, I got this response. Back and forth. This is about Jacob. This is about the well, the fountain. Where's his bucket? It's just firing all cylinders. And he says, oh, I'll tell you. Just go call your husband first. Every conversation that you have that brings up Christ is going to get a point that's uncomfortable. You have to. It always has to get to the heart of the matter. And there, once again, she realized she's still standing outside in the hot day sun still carrying her bucket. Now, Christ reveals out the truth. You've had five husbands, you're living with a new man, but you say the truth. Now, step into the story yourself. If you were standing there, what would you tell that woman? Adulterer! Put a red letter on her. Don't you know the Bible says... Oh, because Christ didn't come into the world to, to condemn the world. He came into the world to save it. 